Modules and Homological Algebra, Lecture 7, Modules. Let R be a ring. Recall that all rings that we consider are unital, and we denote by 1 the unit element in the ring R. Definition. A left module over R is a tuple which consists of an additively written abelian group M and a map, usually denoted by dot, from the product of R and M to M, which is called the action map. And this datum should satisfy the following axioms. First of all, the unitality axiom, 1 times M is equal to M for any M in M. So the identity element of R acts as the identity map on M. Then we have the biadditivity. If we act by R plus S on the sum of M and N, the outcome should be the sum of the outputs of R acting on M, R acting on N, S acting on M, and S acting on N. For all R and S in the ring and M and N in the module. And finally, associativity. For all R and S in the ring and M in the module, applying R to the outcome of the application of S to M should give you the same element as applying the product RS to M. And a small remark on notation, R dot M is sometimes denoted simply as RM or as R of M. Here are some examples. First of all, we have the left regular module R. So the module itself is equal to R. It's an abelian group. And the action is multiplication. And then, of course, all the axioms are satisfied by the properties of the multiplication in a ring. Example two, we have the zero module M in the case of the zero abelian group M, which consists just of the identity element zero. And then we have the only map from R times zero to zero. All elements are sent to zero. So since this map is unique, all axioms are obviously satisfied. So we have our zero module. The notion of a module has an alternative definition. Let M be an abelian group. Then we can consider the set of all endomorphisms of M as an abelian group. And the set has the natural structure of a ring. Here, addition is just the usual addition, so pointwise addition of maps, and multiplication is composition. Alternatively, an R module structure on M is uniquely defined by fixing a ring homomorphism from our ring R to the ring of all endomorphisms of M as an abelian group. Indeed, if we have an R module structure on M, then for each fixed R, the corresponding transformation of M, so which goes from M to M, this is acting on the left with R, is an endomorphism of M due to additivity. And the assignment, when we assign to each R the corresponding endomorphism of M, is a unital ring homomorphism because of our other axioms of unitality, additivity, and associativity, and vice versa. So given a ring endomorphism, we can write down the corresponding action map, which defines a module structure. Here is a prototypical example, and this is an example of all modules over the ring of integers. So let R be the ring of all integers. In this case, we claim that every abelian group M has the unique structure of a Z module. Indeed, if we use the axioms of biadditivity and unitality, then we can describe the action of an integer K on an element M in our abelian group as follows. We can write K in case it is a positive integer, you can write it as a sum of k summons, each being equal to 1. Now we use by additivity to get that this is equal to 1 applied to m plus 1 applied to m and so on. And so due to unitality, this outputs m plus m and so on, m, k summons. So the output of the action of k on m 
is uniquely defined in this way due to axioms. And if k is a negative integer, then we should simply take the sum of minus k summons, each equal to minus m. And of course, if we apply 0 to m, we will get 0. This is very easy to derive directly from the axioms. And if we sum this up, we see that modules over the ring of integers are exactly the same thing as abelian groups. Next, let us talk about submodules and quotients. Let M be an R module. Definition, a submodule of M is a subgroup N of M, which is stable with respect to the action of R. This means that if we take an element R in R and an element N in our subgroup N, then the element R dot N should belong to N. For example, any module has as submodules the module itself and the zero submodule. So these two are always submodules of any module. Example two, if you consider that modules, that is abelian groups, then the notion of a submodule coincides with the notion of a subgroup. So submodules of Z modules are exactly subgroups. Next observation, if N is a submodule of M, then we can consider the corresponding quotient abelian group M divided by N, and this quotient has a natural structure of an R module, which is defined as follows. If we apply R to the coset M plus N, this is by definition the coset of R applied to M, plus n. So to prove this, we actually simply need to verify that this is well defined, that it doesn't depend on the choice of representative in our course. So if we have another element m prime such that m minus m prime belongs to n, then we can do the following computation. If we apply r to m plus n, then since m minus m prime belongs to n, we can rewrite it as r applied to m prime plus m minus m prime plus n. So m minus m prime belong to n, so this element plus n is n. Next, we can use the definition and you write it as r applied to m prime plus m minus m prime, and then by the additivity we will get r applied to m prime plus r applied to m minus m prime plus n. But since n is a submodule, r applied to m minus m prime belongs to n, so we can put it inside n and get r applied to m prime plus n. And this shows that our operation doesn't depend on the choice of the representative. So this operation on the cosets is well defined. And of course, all axioms for the quotient follow directly from the corresponding axioms for the r module m. And this quotient is usually called the quotient of the r module m by the submodule n. Next, let us briefly discuss the notion of modules when applied to algebras rather than rings. So let k be a field and a a k algebra. Definition, an a module is a vector space v over k together with a unital, associative and k linear action of the algebra a on v by linear operators. So for any k vector space v, we have the corresponding k algebra of all k linear endomorphisms of v. And similarly to rings, an A module structure on v is given uniquely by an algebra homomorphism from the algebra A to the algebra of all k linear endomorphisms of v. So such a homomorphism is usually called a representation of A. About submodules, Definition, a submodule of an A module is a subspace of the original module which is stable under the action. And given a submodule of an A module, the quotient of the big module over the submodule has a natural structure of an A module. So we can sum it up as follows. So each algebra is a ring and each module over an algebra is a module over the underlying ring but then we have some additional requirements. Since for algebras we have some base field and everything is considered linear over this base field, we add additional requirements 
for all structures that everything what we talk about should be k, linear. So that's a specification of the notion of a module or representation over an algebra over a field in comparison to modules over rings. So here is an example. The vector space k to the power n has the natural structure of a left module over the algebra of all n times n matrices with coefficients in k, which is given by left multiplication with the matrix. So an element in the vector space k to the power n is the column vector, and we can multiply column vectors on the left with matrices. And all module axioms follow directly from the properties of matrix multiplication. Here's another example. Consider the algebra of all polynomials with coefficients in k with the indeterminate x. As we have seen previously, this algebra is actually a free algebra over the alphabet x. Therefore, for any k vector space v, an algebra homomorphism from this polynomial algebra to the algebra of all k linear endomorphisms of v is uniquely determined by choosing one arbitrary linear endomorphism of v, let's say f. So in other words, for any k vector space v, the k of x module structure on v is uniquely defined by choosing some linear endomorphism of v, which describes the action of our element x, for which the polynomial algebra is free over it. Example three, the vector space k to the power n has a natural structure of a left module over the group algebra of the symmetric group Sn over our field k. So here, the element sigma in Sn, the permutation sigma, acts on the basis vector Ei from the standard basis of Kn by sending it to the element E with the index sigma of i. So it just permutes the basis vectors by permuting the indices of these basis vectors. Next, let us talk about homomorphisms. Let R be a ring and M and N two R modules. Definition, an R module homomorphism from M to N is a group homomorphism phi from N to N, which intertwines the actions of R on M and N. That is, if we apply phi to R dot M, we should get R applied to phi of M for any R and R and M in M. In other words, the following diagram should commute for all R in R. So we start with M, we can apply R, go to M, and then go by phi to N. Alternatively, we start with M, we first apply phi to go to N, and then we apply the action of R and end up in this N. So this should commute. And if you are talking about K algebras, the additional requirement, as usual, is that each homomorphism should be a K linear map. For example, the identity map on any R module M is obviously a homomorphism. So it's a homomorphism from M to M, an endomorphism of M. Actually, it's an automorphism because it is invertible. Example two, the zero map from any module M to any module N is a homomorphism for obvious reasons, because in this diagram, both passes are equal to the zero map. We can compose homomorphisms in the following way. So proposition, let R be a ring and M, N, and K three R modules. Let phi be a homomorphism from M to N and psi a homomorphism from N to K. Claim the composition of phi followed by psi, and this is a map from M to K, is an R homomorphism. Proof, for any M and N and R and R, we can do the following computation. If we apply the composition psi after phi to R applied to M, by definition, this means that we take psi and apply it to phi of R dot M. Since phi is a homomorphism, we can move R out, we commute R and phi. And then since psi is a homomorphism, we commute R and psi. So we get R applied to psi of phi of M. And now again, by definition, this is the same as R applied to Psi after Phi applied to M. And this proves the claim. And of course, since we compose homomorphisms in the same way as we compose maps, this composition is associative. 
whenever this notion makes sense. Let R be a ring and M and M two R modules. Then we have the corresponding set of all R homomorphisms from M to N. This is usually denoted home over R from M to N. And we observe that this set has a natural structure of an abelian group with respect to pointwise addition of maps. And what we need to do, we need to check that the sum of two homomorphisms is a homomorphism, and we also need to check that the opposite of a homomorphism is a homomorphism. So we check the first sink and the second sink is an exercise. So let phi and psi be two homomorphisms from M to N. Then for any R and R and M in M, we can make the following computation. If we apply phi plus psi to R applied to M, by definition, this is equal to phi of R applied to M plus psi of R applied to M. Since phi and psi are homomorphism, we can move R out in both summons. And then we can use the additivity to rewrite it as R applied to phi of M plus psi of M. And now we use definition to rewrite the thing in the bracket as phi plus psi applied to M. And this checks our identity. So this completes our proof. Now let's talk about the kernel in the image. Let R be a ring and M and M two R modules. Let phi be an R homomorphism from M to N. Then we have the kernel of phi and the image of phi. So the kernel of phi is a subgroup of M and the image of phi is a subgroup of N. We claim that the kernel of phi is in fact a submodule of M and the image of phi is a submodule of N. So we prove the first claim and the second claim is an exercise. So for R and R and M in the kernel of phi, if we apply phi to R applied to M, then since phi is a homomorphism, we can move R out. So we get R applied to phi of M. Phi of M is zero because M is in the kernel. So we get R applied to zero and this is zero. So phi applied to R of M is equal to zero, which proves that R of M belongs to the kernel of phi. And this is exactly what we needed to prove. So now with the notions of kernel and the image, we can formulate the isomorphism theorems and all isomorphism theorems follow directly from the corresponding isomorphism theorems for abelian groups. One just has to note that for submodules, sums, kernels, images, and so on are actually submodules. So we have the first isomorphism theorem. If phi is a homomorphism of R modules from M to N, then the quotient of M modulo the kernel of phi is isomorphic to the image of phi as R modules. Second isomorphism theorem. Let M be an R module and N and K be two submodules of M. Then N plus K is a submodule of M and N intersection with K is a submodule of N. Moreover, the quotient of n plus k modulo k is isomorphic to the quotient of n by n intersection with k. And the third isomorphism theorem, let m be an R module, n a submodule of m, and k a submodule of n. Then n over k is a submodule of m over k, and m over n is isomorphic to the quotient of m over k, by n over k. Next, let us talk about generators. Let R be a ring and M an R module. Let X be a subset of M. So we can consider inside M the submodule, which is denoted by X in these triangle brackets, which is defined as the intersection inside M of all submodules N of M which contain X. So by definition, this submodule X in triangle brackets is the minimal submodule of M, which contains X. And in the case when this submodule coincides with the whole of M, we say that X is a generating set for M. And the module M is finitely generated, provided that it has a finite generating set. The first example, if X is the empty set, then the submodule generated by the empty set is the zero submodule of M. 
because any submodule must contain zero. An example two, the left regular module R is always finitely generated because it is generated by the element one. So if you start with element one, then applying the elements of R, we can get all elements of the regular module R. So this module, the left regular module is finitely generated. And as a generating set, we have a singleton set consisting of the identity element. Next, we can now talk about free modules. Let R be a ring and M an R module. Let B be a subset of N. We say that our module M is free over B, provided that for any R module N and any map F from B to N, there is a unique R homomorphism phi from M to N, such that phi of B is equal to F of B for all B in B. In other words, we have the following commutative diagram. We have a natural inclusion of B into M. We have some map from B to N. This is just a map between sets. And then there should exist a unique module homomorphism phi from M to N, which makes this diagram commutative. So for example, the left regular module R is free with a basis given by the identity element. Indeed, for any R module M and any element M in M, there is a unique R homomorphism from the regular module to M, which sends one to M. Namely, this is a homomorphism which sends the element R in R to R applied to our element little m. Of course, any homomorphism which sends one to M must have this property. On the other hand, this property indeed defines a homomorphism. So this shows that the regular module is a free module over the identity element. Now we can discuss direct sums of modules. Let R be a ring and M and N two R modules. The direct sum M plus N, this is an abelian group. So this direct sum has the natural structure of an R module, which is given by the diagonal action. So R applied to the pair M comma N is defined as R applied to M comma R applied to N. For any R in R, M in N and N in N. Indeed, all axioms for this structure follow directly from the corresponding axioms for M and N, because the structure is defined component-wise, and for components, we have the axioms. Definition, an R module M is called indecomposable, provided that it is not zero. And whenever we can write M as the direct sum of two modules, one of the summons should be zero. So whenever M is isomorphic to the direct sum of N and K, either N should be zero or K should be zero. Now we want to reformulate the notion of indecomposability in terms of endomorphisms. And for this, we know that for any R module M, the set of all R endomorphisms of M is actually a ring. We already saw that it is an abelian group, but it's actually a ring where the multiplicative structure is given by composition. And now, with this ring in hand, we can provide the following characterization of indecomposable modules. A non-zero R module M is indecomposable if and only if the only idempotents in, the, in this endomorphism ring of M are the zero map and the identity map. So the zero map and the identity map always belong to the string and they are idempotents. And we claim that this property uniquely characterizes indecomposable modules. Proof. For the only if part, assume that M is decomposed as a direct sum of N plus K with both N and K non-zero. Then define the map phi from M to M as follows. If we apply phi to the tuple N comma K, the outcome is n comma zero. So we kill k and we have identity on m. It is clear that this is an endomorphism of n plus k that is of m and that it is an idempotent. If we apply it twice, it's the same thing as applying it once. Now let us prove the if part. Assume that phi is an idempotent endomorphism of m different from both the zero map and the identity map. Then we can write the identity on M as phi plus identity of M minus phi. Note that identity of M minus an idempotent is also an idempotent, 
Moreover, it's orthogonal to phi. So if you multiply these two in any order, we will get phi minus phi squared, but phi squared is phi, so this is zero. So we can write identity of M as a sum of two pairwise orthogonal eigenpotents. In particular, we can write the whole abelian group M as a direct sum of the images of phi and the identity of M minus phi. And this means that M is decomposable. This is a decomposition of M into a direct sum of two modules. Next, let us discuss finitely generated free modules. Let N be a positive integer. And then we can consider the R module R to the power N, which is a direct sum of N copies of R. The elements of the usual standard basis E1, E2, and so on, EN. So E1 is just an element 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. E2 is 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, and so on. We can consider them as elements in this module R to the power N. And we claim that Rn is free over this standard basis. To prove this, let M be an R module, and M1 and so on, MN, a collection of elements in M. These elements are not necessarily different. We define a map phi from Rn to M as follows. Phi sends the tuple R1 and so on Rn to R1 applied to M1 plus R2 applied to M2 plus and so on. And it is easy to check that this map is a homomorphism. So this proves existence of the homomorphism. And of course, any homomorphism which sends EI to MI must have this property. So this proves uniqueness. And existence and uniqueness proves the theorem that Rn is a free module over this standard basis. So what is the relevance of this free module Rn? This will be important later on in this part of the course. Let R be a ring and M a non-zero finitely generated R module. Let X be a finite generating set for M. Note that X is non-empty because M is non-zero. So let X have cardinality K. Then for any N greater than or equal to K, there are surjective maps from our standard basis of Rn to X. By the free property of the free module Rn, we just proved that this is a free module, this map induces a surjective R homomorphism from our module Rn to M. The bottom line, every finitely generated R module is a quotient of some free module R to the power N. It's quite interesting that the following observation is more difficult than it seems. So if R is a commutative ring, then the fact that the module Rn is isomorphic to the module Rk implies N is equal to K. So the number of elements in the standard basis is actually an invariant of a free module. But this is for commutative R. So here is the proof. Let I be a maximal ideal of R. So it exists by Zorn's lemma. Then the quotient of a commutative ring by a maximal ideal is a field. And so if we take our free module Rn and factor it out by I times Rn, this becomes an n-dimensional vector space over the field R modulo I. And from the linear algebra course, we know that the dimension of a finite dimensional vector space over a field is uniquely defined. And this means that the rank of our free module over a commutative ring is also uniquely defined. Remark, it's quite counterintuitive, but the notion of this rank, N, for the free module for non-commutative rings might not be uniquely defined. So there exist non-commutative rings for which the rank of a free module is not a well-defined invariant. Let us sum up some important properties which we already discussed. First of all, for any ring R and any R module M, there is a bijection between the set of all R homomorphisms from R to M and M, which sends the homomorphism phi to its value at the element one. And this is just a reformulation of the free property 
of the regular R module R, which has basis one. So for each choice of phi of one in M, there is a unique homomorphism from R to M, which sends one to this element. Proposition two, for any ring R, we have a ring isomorphism between the ring of all endomorphisms of the free R module R and R op. And here is a proof. Proposition one tells us that there is an isomorphism as sets, in fact, as abelian groups. So we only need to check that the operation on the left-hand side is opposite to the operation on the right-hand side. For this, let us apply two endomorphism phi and psi and compute the image of the identity under their composition. So if we apply phi to psi of one, we can write psi of one as psi of one times one, and then we can move psi of one from phi because phi is a homomorphism. And we get psi of one, phi of one. And we see that on the left-hand side, we had phi after psi, but on the right-hand side, we have psi of one times phi of one. So we see that the product is reverse. So this explains this opposite in this endomorphism. And finally, let us discuss simple modules. Let R be a ring and M an R module. We say that M is simple, provided that it is not zero, and the only submodules of M are M and zero. Remark, the representation of a ring which corresponds to a simple module is usually called an irreducible representation. This is just the terminology. Let's note that any simple module is indecomposable because if we have a decomposition of module into the direct sum, both summons are non-trivial submodules. Here are some other examples. So simple Z modules are exactly the simple abelian groups. Example two, simple modules over fields are exactly the one-dimensional vector spaces. Example three, if R is commutative, then the regular module R is simple if and only if R is a field, because submodules of the regular module are exactly left ideals. So for commutative rings, this means that there are no two-sided ideals, so R should be a field. Some problems and questions. Question one, prove with all details that for any module M over a ring R, we have that zero applied to M is equal to zero for all M and M. Question two, let M be an R module and N and K two submodules of M. Prove that N plus K is a submodule of M. Question three, let N be an R module and N and K two submodules of M. Prove that N intersection with K is a submodule of N. Question four, let X be a subset of an R module M. Show that the submodule generated by X coincides with the sum over all X in X of R applied to X, the whole ring R. And question five, let F be a homomorphism from an R module M to an R module M. Prove with all details that the map minus F from M to N is also an R homomorphism. Thank you very much and see you next time.